apologies. I'm, I'm just going to be uh, reusing my slides from uh, the other day. Um, so uh, just to give you a bit of background, uh, my name is Dinan. Uh, I'm Indonesian. Uh, I, I work at Revolut. Uh, so I've, uh, I joined Revolut last year uh, as a data analyst. So uh, now I'm a data risk manager. So it's a completely different role now. Um, so um, just so in this uh, session, I, I'm just going to walk you through uh, how we chose Amundsen and what kind of uh, customization we did uh, on Amundsen to support some of our uh, data governance initiatives. So it's not going to be technical at all. Uh, but at least I uh, just want to share you how, how we sort of like customize, uh, you know, the, the front end of Amundsen to support some of our, uh, you know, uh, existing processes. So, yeah, that's a bit about myself, but uh, so uh, at Revolut, we, uh, we have continuously growing. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with Revolut, we are a digital bank based on based, based in uh, UK and Europe. So we have presence uh, all over Europe, and also we have uh, start to expand to the US and India as well. And I'm sure that we'll be expanding to different markets at some point in the future. So uh, we also start offering new products um, for our retail uh, junior and business customers. So we. Uh, the team is growing and obviously the uh, amount of data that we're generating are also growing. And then in the past uh, year, we actually have seen that uh, the volume of data in our data warehouse has increased four times. and uh, It's increasing exponentially with no sign of stopping. Um, so um, that's why we sort of uh, try to explore uh, the option of uh, using Amundsen as our data discovery tool. So next. So this is our old solution. So it's not pretty. So basically all of our uh, metadata in data warehouse is controlled in YAML files where we store it in a single repository. And then this YAML files will have all the uh, amount of metadata, the logic that goes into uh, the tables or views and uh, other um, sort of like metadata, like the owners, the uh, maintainers, etc. So uh, the way we did it, we uh, we have uh, spin up the CI/CD and then it basically used the Confluence API to generate uh, pages in Confluence. But obviously, uh, this is this is fine when you had when you had like hundreds of tables, but when you have thousands of uh, tables, it's no longer fit for purpose. And you know, in Confluence, um, you have a lot of different information, like different documentation, like process documents, uh, policies, etc. So let's say if you look for uh, transactions data, for example, it will take you to a lot of different places that probably that's probably not relevant uh, for you. So next. Uh, also, we, we came across a lot of problems as well, like uh, I'm sure uh, people have come across this as well. Um, so we don't know who maintains the data, who uses the data, even though we have all the data available, uh, but we don't have a place to um, you know, display all this information. So it becomes a waste. And then we also spend a lot of time uh, like answering uh, the same questions every time. Uh, and then people are more likely to go to Slack and then ask this same questions, even though uh, the information are available on Confluence. So we need to find a way um, to start reducing the number of uh, ad hoc questions because it start, you know, taking a lot of our time. And then uh, people have a lot of a low trust on our um, data as well because our our metadata pages are out of date. And you know, Confluence is definitely not the place uh, for these kind of things. Um, also, it's not really the right tool to put together all of our data uh, governance initiatives. Next. Uh, so this is where Amundsen come in. So I'm sure you've seen uh, how it looked like. So we can skip the, la the next two, three pages. That's OK. 
it may still be helpful for us to learn like what uh how you how you see this and what you modified here that would be super awesome oh, we'll, uh we'll come we'll come to that uh, okay cool. after, after so yeah um so why we choose amundsen like uh honestly uh we the uh key uh value adding points that uh we considered was the customization and also it's cheap so we spent um, only a month. So two of us, me and a uh, data engineer, was spending time on implementing Amundsen. So uh, we have the, uh, you know, the, the, the architecture exactly the same as the article that Stemma shared uh, like a few months ago. So literally there's no difference, um, but we do a lot of customization on the front end. And yeah, next. Yeah, next. So um, on the data builder side, because uh, as I mentioned, we use uh, metadata repository uh, with YAML files to control everything in our data warehouse. We need, we want to uh, use those YAML as a single source of truth. So instead of pulling the metadata from uh, the database directly, uh, or uh, we use XSL as our data warehouse, it's like, German powered uh, analytical database. And so instead of that, we want to pull the information from the YAMLs. So uh, we basically use this uh, CSV extractor and then put some stuff on top of it um, uh, to basically pull the information for, for, from uh, the YAML files. And then it's the same for XSL uh, because we didn't want to spend a lot of time. We, we just, uh, write some codes on top of the uh, CSV extractor. And then we basically pull uh, whatever information that we couldn't get from the YAMLs, like uh, when the when the uh, table was last updated or the few dependencies or uh, the usage of uh, the tables. So this information we have to get directly from XSL. So that's why we had to do this. And then for other DBs, we, uh, we, we could use you know, the default uh, options on the uh, data builder framework, but we haven't really uh, decided whether to pull data from the other DBs because once we pull the information from the source databases, then the amount of the volume of uh, information in Amundsen will uh, will basically like more than double, and then it's not really nice for the end users to to see a lot of information that are not relevant, especially. Um, in the source database, the metadata is not really maintained. So currently we only pull information from uh, XSL and our YAML files. Next. And then here uh, with Amundsen, we want to make sure that uh, we establish trust in our data. So uh, there are four main uh, data governance initiatives that we did in the past, uh, past year. So first is to establish the ownership. Uh, so for each table, we know who's accountable for those and who maintain uh, the completeness and accuracy of those uh, tables. And then we also have, um, have an internal data quality framework, which we want to integrate um, with Amundsen. Uh, and then we also want to make sure that everyone's aware of you know, the, the accuracy of metadata and we can display that in Amundsen as well. And then lastly, we have a very simplistic uh, data lineage uh, tool in our uh, internally, uh, like a simple dashboard. And we want to also show that within a, in Amundsen as well. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So, um, so for the uh, data ownership initiatives, we basically want to differentiate between uh, maintainers who are individuals and owners or the team or domain. So instead of calling the uh, own individuals as owners, we change it to maintainers. And then we have the owner description uh, specifically uh, at the bottom of the page. And then uh, as I mentioned, we want to make sure that the single source of truth is always the YAML files. So we disable any kind of uh, editing functionality in Amundsen. So uh, if e everything is disabled and then let's say if you want to edit, then it will send you directly to the uh, Bitbucket uh, repository. Next. 
Um, and then we also use the table stats uh, URLs to link to the uh, dashboard where we have the table stats and the uh, data quality scores. And then we use um, the badging as well to indicate uh, which tables are critical because uh, we need that to, to understand which tables are used for regulatory reporting, for example. And then uh, we, we do other kind of things using the badging. Um, for example, tables that has been uh, deprecated or disabled, we also have a badge as well. And then next. Um, yeah, and then we also use the column level badging uh, to uh, indicate primary keys, uh, like sensitive columns as well. Uh, and then uh, for users who are more technical, uh, we have the key ETL information uh, on the left hand side. Uh, so we have the source uh, connection of the tables, and then we also have um, the source code, um, uh, the query as well. Um, and then we also have the uh, other information uh, like SLA and stuff. Next. Um, and then here we also have, uh, as I mentioned, we have met a bit, uh, our data quality, no data lineage dashboard on MetaBase. And we basically uh, link that to uh, every single table uh, in Amundsen. Uh, so it, it will directly uh, give you, you know, the exact schema and the exact table name when you when you go to the, the page. And then on the left hand side, we try to be creative with how we display like dependent objects in, in the, our database. So for example, for views, it will show you uh, how many, which views are using a particular table and vice versa. And then on the next page, we'll have uh, another, okay, not this one. Um, is there another page of that? Uh, this is what I have. Yeah, okay. And then next one, I think, okay. No, okay, I missed that page. So basically uh, what we have, uh, so let's say if uh, we have a view, uh, we basically display how the view is generated in the description and then uh, create a URLs to the to the Amundsen page. So for example, if, if it's an automatically generated views, then it will say uh, which table is actually coming from in the description and also on the related objects, uh, the customized description on the bottom. So uh, by using that, people can always go to the source table because you know the view, inf the information of the view is usually limited, and we don't have you know the ETL uh, information or the connections or or, or even uh, sometimes they don't have the the query. So uh, we always try to direct people to the actual source table rather than um, you know the the downstream uh, views or tables. So yeah, I mean um, that's how we how how we use uh, Amundsen. So currently we're on uh, on front end we're on version three point one I think. So we haven't we haven't really upgraded much, but obviously uh, we, we we're gonna be upgrading it at some point uh, this year, hopefully in Q four, um, and yeah. And then next one, so. Uh, just uh, a bit of the impact uh, of Amundsen uh, on our uh, on our day-to-day -day, uh, work. So we've seen uh, from from some of the feedback uh, from our data users, we've seen that people are less likely to go on Slack and ask uh, you know uh, data questions that are already uh, available on Amundsen. So at least in the past. In the last three months since we introduced Amundsen, we we managed to reduce the amount of uh, you know similar questions and hopefully uh, some of the resources and energy to answer those questions have been reallocated to something more uh, meaningful and value adding. So that's everything. Um, so thanks everyone. So if anyone has any question, please fire away.
if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. I will track your hands um, and give the podium to you. Um, I'll kick it off, Dean, and while we wait for folks to raise hands. Uh, that that uh, that Slack question chart was pretty interesting how it got switched more to the left side. Were there any other questions that you had asked and what was the feedback um, or results on those questions? So um, I think we, we, we had questions on um, how how do you rate like you know the the previous solution and and Amundsen? Obviously, it's uh, completely different. It's like the difference is day and night. So I'm not I'm not gonna, even gonna mention that because Amundsen is way better than what we had previously. Um, and then uh, the other question is the in terms of the usage, uh, we've seen that people use it more often uh, because uh, I think I spoke to a couple of people and they they when they open confluence they get frustrated because they never uh never um get to their answers quickly enough so now because we, they have amundsen they they just put in their their bookmark and then just use it more often um uh during the day so previously they just use um confluence probably once or twice a day but we've seen people using amundsen more often than that that's great um, other questions for Dina? Oh, there is a hand. Let me see who that is. Uh, Michael has got a question. Uh, yeah, the question is, is the lineage graph that Dina showed, is that is that uh, in Amundsen today or is that custom? Um, maybe I can, I can take that. Uh, that lineage graph is a design that was provided by Lyft a few months ago. Uh, there has been an alpha version of that graph implemented uh, by Verdan and Boyan. Uh, that is available as a part of the Amazon project right now. Uh, there's a lot more work we need to do on that particular implementation. Um, so if you try it out, would love your uh, feedback um, that we need in order to improve that. Okay, thanks a lot. Other questions? There's one more. Let's find who that is. Uh, Marvan. Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the ingestion pipeline you have. You mentioned that you depend on the YAML file for the metadata extraction. Uh, but however, like the metadata also drives the, um, I believe, the, the data, or data warehouse. So how mm -hmm. do you manage like both of them to not diverge, to have like metadata that is not on like on the live system, on the production system? So we we basically um, the, the team um, the data team at Rackfluid basically uh, has disabled all the uh, DML commands uh, on the data warehouse. So if you want to create anything, it will have to go through uh, the YAMLs, and the description will also automatically generate it from the description that you write in your YAML files. So everything is very controlled. And we don't let uh, people to create uh, random tables or views um, themselves. So, I mean, there's a the challenge would be to review all the PRs. So we get a lot of uh, backlog uh, reviewing these PRs because yeah, the size is growing and there's only a certain number of people who can who can review those PRs. But we the key is we don't want uh, people to just create things um as, like uh, you know um without without people reviewing and actually um you know controlling uh what goes into the data warehouse mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, thanks a lot thank you dina in the interest of time we're going to move to the next presentation and if you have any other questions for dina uh, please hit them up on slack